Chapter Twenty Six of the Life of Benjamin Franklin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of Benjamin Franklin by Samuel G. Goodrich. Chapter Twenty Six Morals of Chess playing at chess is the most ancient and universal game known among men for its origin is beyond the memory of history and it has for numberless ages been the amusement of all the civilized nations of asia the persians the indians and the chinese europe has had it above a thousand years the spaniards have spread it over their parts of america and it begins to make its appearance in these states it is so interesting in itself as not to need the view of gain to induce engaging in it and hence it is never played for money those therefore who have leisure for such diversions cannot find one that is more innocent and the following piece written with a view to correct among a few young friends some little improprieties in the practice of it shows at the same time that it may in its effects on the mind be not merely innocent but advantageous to the vanquished as well as the victor the game of chess is not merely an idle amusement several very valuable qualities of the mind useful in the course of human life are to be acquired or strengthened by it so as to become habits ready for all occasions for life is a kind of chess in which we have points to gain and competitors or adversaries to contend with and in which there is a vast variety of good and ill events that are in some degree the effects of prudence or the want of it by playing at chess then we learn foresight which looks a little into futurity considers the consequences that may attend an action for it is continually occurring to the player if i move this piece what will be the advantage of my new situation what use can my adversary make of it to annoy me what other moves can i make to support it and to defend myself from his attacks circumspection which surveys the whole chessboard or scene of action the relations of the several pieces and situation the dangers they are respectfully exposed to the several possibilities of their aiding each other the probability that the adversary may take this or that move and attack this or the other piece and what different means can be used to avoid his stroke or turn its consequences against him caution not to make your moves too hastily this habit is best acquired by observing strictly the laws of the game such as if you touch a piece you must move it somewhere if you set it down you must let it stand and it is therefore best that these rules should be observed as the game thereby becomes more the image of human life and particularly of war in which if you have incautiously put yourself into a bad and dangerous position you cannot obtain your enemy's leave to withdraw your troops and place them more securely but you must abide all the consequences of your rashness and lastly we learn by chess the habit of not being discouraged by present bad appearances in the state of our affairs the habit of hoping for a favorable change and that of persevering in the search of resources the game is so full of events there is such a variety of turns in it the fortune of it is so subject to sudden vicissitudes and one so frequently after long contemplation discovers the means of extricating oneself from a supposed insurmountable difficulty that one is encouraged to continue the contest to the last in hope of victory by our own skill or at least of giving a stalemate by the negligence of our adversary 
and whoever considers what in chess he often sees instances of that particular pieces of success are apt to produce presumption and its consequent inattention by which the loss may be recovered will learn not to be too much discouraged by the present success of his adversary nor to despair of final good fortune upon every little check he receives in the pursuit of it that we may therefore be induced more frequently to choose this beneficial amusement in preference to others which are not attended with the same advantages every circumstance which may increase the pleasure of it should be regarded and every action or word that is unfair disrespectful or that in any way may give uneasiness should be avoided as contrary to the immediate intention of both the players which is to pass the time agreeably therefore first if it is agreed to play according to the strictest rules then those rules are to be exactly observed by both parties and should not be insisted on for one side while deviated from by the other for this is not equitable secondly if it is agreed not to observe the rules exactly but one party demands indulgences he should then be as willing to allow them to the other thirdly no false move should ever be made to extricate yourself out of a difficulty or to gain an advantage there can be no pleasure in playing with a person once detected in such unfair practices fourthly if your adversary is long in playing you ought not to hurry him or to express any uneasiness at his delay you should not sing nor whistle nor look at your watch nor take up a book to read nor make a tapping with your feet on the floor or with your fingers on the table nor do anything that may disturb his attention for all these things displease and they do not show your skill in playing but your craftiness or your rudeness fifthly you ought not to endeavor to amuse and deceive your adversary by pretending to have made bad moves and saying that you have now lost the game in order to make him secure and careless and inattentive to your schemes for this is fraud and deceit not skill in the game sixthly you must not when you have gained a victory use any triumphing or insulting expression nor show too much pleasure but endeavor to console your adversary and make him feel less dissatisfied with himself by every kind of civil expression that may be used with truth such as you understand the game better than i but you are a little inattentive or you play too fast or you had the best of the game but something happened to divert your thoughts and that turned it in my favor seventhly if you are a spectator while others play observe the most perfect silence for if you give advice you offend both parties him against whom you give it because it may cause the loss of his game and him in whose favor you gave it because though it may be good and he follows it he loses the pleasure he might have had if you had permitted him to think until it had occurred to himself even after a move or moves you must not by replacing the pieces show how it might have been placed better for that displeases and may occasion disputes and doubts about their true situation all talking to the players lessens or diverts their attention and is therefore unpleasing nor should you give the least hint to either party by any kind of noise or motion if you do you are unworthy to be a spectator if you have a mind to exercise or show your judgment do it in playing your own game when you have an opportunity 
not in criticizing or meddling with or counseling the play of others lastly if the game is not to be played rigorously according to the rules above mentioned then moderate your desire of victory over your adversary and be pleased with one over yourself snatch not eagerly at every advantage offered by his unskillfulness or inattention but point out to him kindly that by such a move he places or leaves a piece in danger and unsupported that by another he will put his king in a perilous situation and etc by this generous civility so opposite to the unfairness above forbidden you may indeed happen to lose the game to your own opponent but you will win what is better his esteem his respect and his affection together with the silent approbation and good will of impartial spectators end of chapter twenty six recording by sharon kilmer rio medina texas